Okay, we're gonna discuss different types and styles of diesel engines. And this one here we have in particular is an 855 cubic inch engine. Um, and it's a Cummins brand engine. Now it's an I6 engine, which means it's an inline six cylinder engine. And this particular unit uses what's called the pressure time system for delivering the volume of fuel based on the time and the delivery value that the engine needs as it's running at various RPMs. So a couple things we're gonna do here is one, we need to connect the power pack to this particular engine. And this engine uses a 24 volt cranking motor. So we have to connect the 24 volt power pack to it to be able to start the engine. And then once we have that connected, we have to make sure that our fuel system is connected and we have the inlet fuel and the return. Every diesel engine uses fuel supply and return. The return allows the engine to have enough volume there depending upon one thing that we typically look at in most engine designs is throttle demand. And the throttle in this particular engine is here and it's gonna be manually operated. Normally it would be connected with a pedal assembly, not like the new engines now which use an electronic pedal assembly and that sends an input signal to the computer and determines the rate of fuel. This one is all done mechanically. So it's a mechanical injected engine based on a pressure time fuel system. The other thing this engine uses is what's called a JWAC, which is a jacketed water after cooler. So these two lines on the front here allow the cooling system to bring the heat exchanger on, this, on the inside of this jacketed water after cooler to bring the cooler up to temperature, same temperature as the coolant. So that allows a consistent volume of air to come into the engine based on coolant temperature. Okay, so what we've done is we've connected a remote fuel supply to the inlet of the, the pump for the engine. We keep the supply away from the engine for a safety aspect. You can see the fuel comes in in this direction through the filter, through the head, and then to the pump. This is a pressure time Cummins pump system, and it also has a fuel solenoid. The fuel solenoid is connected to the ignition wire or the key switch. So we also have on this side of the solenoid a manual screw that allows the technician or myself in this particular case to allow the solenoid to be turned on or off and when I run this engine we're gonna do this manually so the fuel once I turn this solenoid on manually it allows the fuel to come through the pump through the solenoid and to the heads in particular for the delivery of the fuel then we also have fuel return back to the pump and back to the entrance side of the pump or on the low side. So when that happens, we always have that constant demand there or constant supply there. So when the demand is high based on throttle application, we always have the right amount of delivery for the fuel. So looking at the front of the engine now, we have our turbocharger on this side, and this is actually the compressor housing. And when it's driven by the turbine of the turbocharger, it creates pressurized air that flows up to the jacketed water after cooler. Here's the inlet lines that we have to connect directly to the cooling system for maintaining a consistent temperature of air coming into the engine. The other thing we're gonna do is prior to running it, we're gonna check the engine oil level make sure we're ready to run. You can see here we have the exhaust manifold. Here is our head. We have our rocker box assembly. And then this engine actually uses a Jake assembly, which we will look at as we continue on. Okay, I have my remote starter connected to the cranking system. And what I'm gonna do is, as we discussed already about the operation of the solenoid valve, I'm gonna manually operate this during cranking so you can see what happens is that when I wind the screw in, it allows the fuel to be delivered to the engine. So the engine will start, idle, and then I can throttle the engine and we can listen to the response of how it responds based on my throttle position. So I'm gonna go ahead and crank the engine.
So you can see again what I've done is I've wound the screw back out, cutting off the fuel supply to the engine, allowing the engine to stop. Now what we're going to do from here is we're going to take a look at the operation of the valve train in the engine and the jake brake assembly compared to a typical 855 engine that does not have jakes. So this one is a jake engine, so we'll take a look at the operation. Okay, so we're taking a look at the Jacobs engine brake housing. A couple different things on here, and at this point we're not going to go through the actual function of it, but the solenoid valve is activated when the driver turns this Jacobs brake on. Now the idea of the Jake brake is to use the compression in the engine to actually slow the engine down and then dumping the potential charge or potential energy in that stroke, dump it out the exhaust, which actually slows the piston down and causes the engine to slow down. Now when that's coupled to the right gear, as the driver does that, it helps slow the engine down and slow the whole chassis down. So what I'm going to do is typically is operate this Jake brake prior to the engine getting up to operating temperature so I can listen to the audible tone that it makes and determine if it's functioning and if it's functioning strong enough. If it's not, then I would go through the procedure to adjust it based on the manufacturer's recommendation for the setting. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start the engine up and then I'm going to operate the Jake brake and let you hear what happens at idle and then typical uh, application at a higher engine R RPM. So now this particular setup on this engine, again, uses the Jake brake head, not like some other engines that actually don't have the Jake head, they just use the rocker box assembly and it does not have a compression brake on the engine. Okay, just taking a look a little further at this Jacobs head here that we have. We have the solenoid, and you've seen in the video that this is where I manually overrided the electrical signal that the driver usually turns on in the cab to initiate the function and operation of the Jake brake assembly. So the solenoid valve, then when it's turned on or manually turned on or electrically turned on, it sends oil to the master or the control piston. That control piston then locks out the volume of oil that's inside the head causes a hydraulic effect that moves down what's called the slave piston. So the solenoid turns the system on, the control or master piston creates the pressure needed to actually move the slave to open up the exhaust valves. So when the exhaust valves are open, what ends up happening is we dump that potential energy charge out of the cylinder out the exhaust and that's the audible tone that we hear when we're running the engine. So just looking a little further at this particular engine type and style, it's the i6 inline six cylinder engine. It uses an exhaust manifold, typical to most diesel engines, but this one is turbocharged. So we have the turbocharger here and this is actually called the turbine housing. So the rejected heat from the engine and the expanding hot gases as it's leaving the cylinder actually spool up the turbine, which are coupled to the compressor side of the turbo. So we have a center section here that has pressurized engine oil to be able to help support the rotating speed of this particular turbo. Now, not in this video, but I, I went ahead and I checked the RPM range of this compressor at idle and idling was around 6,200 RPMs. When I went full throttle on this particular engine and checked the compressor speed, it was actually somewhere around 65,000 RPMs. So a big difference between what it was idling at and what it was creating at maximum speed. Now, as the engine creates more rejected heat with load, it causes the compressor to produce more charge air. This is what we call charge air that goes up and goes directly to the intake manifold. 
Now, some engines use an air-to-air -air aftercooler, which actually reduces the temperature that's created in the compressor. Anytime we compress air, we're going to cause a temperature rise. So this particular engine uses, again, the jacketed water aftercooler to maintain a consistent air temperature intake to the engine as opposed to a higher heat temperature from the compressor. The most efficient type of a charge air that we have on pretty well every highway tractor today is an air-to-air -air aftercooler to actually reduce that temperature of operation. Now the center section also has an oil return line that allows the oil, after it lubricates the turbocharger bearings, to go down back to the sump and then to be filtered and again sending it back up as clean cooler oil.